lived experiences of the film industry, uh, striving to re-examine and reframe women's contributions to the film industry. Uh, so contributions that have been historically sort of hidden um, and overlooked. This work's helpfully framed in the introduction to Bina Negra's A Feminist Reader in Early Cinema, in which they write that the early years of the 21st century are a critical period for feminist reflection on the cinema of the early 20th century. The access to historical materials fostered by the digital age and the recent escalation in the public sphere of qualitatively new interest in silent cinema has made possible the visibility, the remarkable number of roles played by early women producers, directors, stars and writers in the formation of the industry. So considerable research has been undertaken in terms of showcasing the narratives of women working in all areas of the film industries during this period. Um, this is demonstrated by Shelley Stamp's work into the pioneering film director Lois Ware and Melody Bridges and Cheryl Robinson's edited collection on the women pioneers of silent cinema. And while these texts offer really invaluable contributions to film, hi hi film history, recognizing the skill and labor of women in various areas of the industry, there are still fundamental gaps that remain to be addressed. And this is particularly apparent in relation to performance and the analysis of performance. And one of the key methodological approaches within my PhD reflect a trans-historical performance studies approach to research, offering multiple theoretical lenses through which to engage with a sustained, sustained historical analysis of performance practice. So drawing on a combination of semiotic performance analysis and empirical historical film research, my thesis looked at the work of nine actresses who are producing screen performances in Britain and America throughout the transition from silent to sound film. And these included Clara Bow, Lillian Gish, Marion Pickford, Greta Garbo, as well as Nora Baring and Madeleine Carroll. So my paper today, I'm going to address the issue of discourses within film hi history, which obscure and erase women's skill and labor as screen actresses in favor of privileging the work of the director as auteur and the creator of film performance. So focusing on the work of two British actresses, Nora Baring and Madeleine Carroll, my paper today will shift the focus towards analyzing film performance, looking away from the director and onto the actresses who ultimately constructed and embodied these leading roles. In doing so, this paper will reconsider the significance of recognizing the pre-performative labor of actresses and the training and technique which inform their screen acting and in doing so centralize the work of the actress. I'd argue that it's only once these elements have been fully understood that the work of screen performers and the analysis of that work can be fully articulated. Um, and I really liked what Dr. Sam Hurst um, talked about earlier in her sort of contextualization of this idea of what we mean by sort of hidden uh, within popular culture, because obviously these films themselves, like the, the texts themselves aren't hidden. Um, and they're not sort of, they are discussed in academic sort of critical research, but it's normally always um, from the consideration of the director. And um, there is very little consideration of the women um, and the performances within these pieces of works. So then I would argue that it's the women creating these performances that have sort of been hidden within the narrative um, of film history. So throughout 1928 to 1930, UK press coverage surrounding Nora Baring boasted of her unusual beauty, marking her out as distinctive with a potential for stardom. Gaining popularity for her performance in the 1928 silent drama Underground, British magazines positioned Baring as an up and coming star, earning her a fan club along with other popular British stars such as Betty Balfour. However, despite the praise and her appearances in numerous successful silent and sound films in Britain, there yet to remain, there yet to be sort of any critical writing produced on Baring's performances. And in a similar vein, between 1937 and 1942, British actress, British actress Madeleine Carroll was listed among the most popular and highest paid actresses in Hollywood. But as with Baring, Carroll's on-screen performances have been neglected within British film history, with her silent films ren seemingly rendered inconsequential. Yet while Baring and Carroll's respective careers ultimately followed distinctly different trajectories, they both have something in common in terms of how they've been, their roles that have been played have been documented within film history. 
That is, they're both, they both feature as footnotes, bracketed references, cast lists, and contextual references in academic writings, which herald the work of director Alfred Hitchcock. So as highlighted by Bina Negra, the access to historical materials fostered by the digital age had proven uh, particularly valuable in terms of my own research aims. So through access to digital archives, such as Lantern, the Media History Digital Library, and British newspaper archives. Uh, so for those unfamiliar with the Lantern Digital Library, um, it's a, fleet, a free sort of online repository of sort of millions um, of fan magazines and sort of other texts relating to film and broadcast history that is all sort of just available online for anybody to access. Um, it's been hugely helpful in terms of undertaking research while access to physical archives hasn't been possible. Therefore, while academic writings and popularist film history texts have neglected the performances of Barring and Carol, there is a wealth of archival material available to build a picture of these actresses' experiences working during this period. Moreover, these archival holdings offer narratives that demonstrate these women's agency outside of their association with a certain notable director. Therefore, while sources offer significant information regarding career trajectory, training background, industry experience, which when combined with analysis of performance, allows for a more fully developed consideration of the labor of these leading ladies. Okay, so my first case study will be Nora Barring. So unlike those stars of the silent screen, whose legacies have endured, such as Colleen Moore, Lillian Gish, or Marion Pickford, for example. Barring never produced an autobiography offering a personal account of her performance processes or a definitive narrative that represents how she may have wanted to be perceived as a film actress. Yet despite this, throughout her relatively short career, there are a number of magazine articles and interviews with Barring that provide useful insight into her performance background. These first-hand accounts can be pieced together to create a coherent picture of the way in which Boring approached various elements of her performance practice. In an interview with Film Weekly titled Made in Germany, Boring discusses her journey to becoming a film actress, revealing that she had performed in several small roles in British theatre before making connections with British film director and screenwriter John Autumn and actor Miles Mander, who helped her to get bit parts in the Svenska film industry in, at Ufa in Germany. So Boring states, then things began to work themselves out for me. After I'd played a small part in a film with Miles Mander, John Orton introduced me to Bruce Wolfe, through whom I met Anthony Asquith. I played under his direction in Underground and returned with him to Berlin to play in Princess Priscilla. It's clear from this breakdown how Barring first came to work in the film that how Barring first came to work in the film industry, that there are multiple performance experiences that may have potentially influenced her screen acting style. That is, while Barring began performing on the British stage prior to performing within a British film context, she also worked in European film, and not only that, but in German Swedish co-productions. Therefore, the opportunity to be influenced by a variety of schools of training and teaching would have been far greater so it would have been far greater than if Barring had worked purely in British film and theatre. The first section of analysis will begin to address the particular screen style utilised in Barring's performance in the 1929 silent romantic thriller A Cottage on Dartmoor, paying particular attention to her engagement with pictorial performance, a style of gestural performance rooted in stage melodrama, drawing on sequences of stylized poses. The scene we'll look at takes place towards the end of the film in Sally's cellar, where her jilted admirer Joe has hidden after escaping from jail, with Barring playing the role of Sally and Uno Henning in the role of Joe. So Barring stands motionless in the cellar, staring off camera. Her arm is bent at the elbow, with her hand hovering in front of, but not touching her mouth. The left side of her face is in shadow, angled towards the camera. She brings her hand up to the side of her cheek, partly covering her lips, but with a palm facing outwards, her fingers softly curved. Her brow is furrowed as she continues to stare towards Her Henning. She then slowly moves her hand away from her face. In this moment, there's a clear focus on the way in which Barring's hands are framing and drawing attention to her face. Indeed, throughout the film, Barring's face, neck and extended posture 
are often the focus of the camera. In magazine reviews and articles, references to Barring's unusual face comment on her long, delicately, delicately formed face with its big, intelligent brown eyes and its frame of dark hair, and point out that her narrow body and huge, rather wild black eyes create an ethereal quality. Similarly, in Anthony Asquith's biography, he's quoted as saying that Barring looked rather like a Medigliani, the Italian painter renowned for his portraits of women with elongated necks and noses. However, rather than reading these statements as just observations of Barring's appearance, this case study will further explore the fact that the way in which Barring holds herself, framing her face, elongating her body and looking down her nose appears to be a very deliberate part of her particular performance style and mode of expression. As the scene continues, the camera switches back to Henning as he moves out of the shadows towards the camera and thusly towards Barring. Barring begins to move backwards, slowly, into the shadows. As she does this, she moves her right shoulder backwards, angling her body away from him, and begins to lower her arm as she takes a step back. Her fingers slowly open as she maintains an open palm towards him. As Barring moves into the light, her arm is still raised so that her hand is parallel to her face, but her palm is now turned to the left. Her posture is straight but reclined, as she reaches the table, she puts her arm out steady, sorry, arm out behind her to steady herself. The slow recline in Barring's spine as she moves away from Henning once more emphasizes the length in her neck and torso, an apparent key component in Barring's expressive moment, uh, movement. Indeed, as Cynthia Barron and Sharon Karniki argue, whether it's consciously or intuitively, through training and experience, actors learn that connotations can be conveyed by particular gestures and expression in order to determine exactly what part of the body must most effectively be, be manipulated to convey a given type of emotion. The way in which the emotions Byron performs are unique to how she modulates her body and facial expression into the embodied emotion. Nevertheless, Byron's performance with Herring Henning provides a pertinent example of performers working with people from different training backgrounds, creating a fruitful environment for the exchange and influence of a variety of techniques. In terms of tracing the multiple performance herit heritages at play within this example, it's useful to break down the backgrounds and trajectories of each performer. So Baring was a British actress who began performing in regional British theatres before traveling to France and Germany to work in film, and then who then returned to Britain to work in film. Henning was a Swedish actor who trained in a formal Swedish drama school before working in Swedish cinema and then came to work in British film. Both Baring and Herring brought a wealth of performance experience to their work, influenced by different countries and environments. Highlighting the prevalence of Scandinavian actors and actresses, such as Henning, moving to work in other national cinemas throughout this period, and the subsequent impact on screen acting styles as a result of this, Arna Lund's Nordic Exposures, Scandinavian Identities in Classical Hollywood Cinema point out that there has been a lack of investigation into or theorization of the influence of Scandinavian performance on Hollywood prior to sound. Yet there is clearly a connection to be made here between Scandinavian screen acting and Barring's British performances here, particularly in relation to the element of emotional restraint. As Lund argues, the Scandinavian performance traditions of both the Ibsenian and Strindbergian theatre, as well as the naturalist gestural systems of Scandinavian screen acting, likely contributed to an imported aesthetic category of subtle and natural performance styles as well. Indeed, when analysing Barron's silent performances, the speed at which she moves her body and the careful precision of, in the placement of her hands creates a, a highly histronic and gestural performance that is simultaneously smooth and fluid in transition. The smoothness is conveyed through elements of subtlety and an avoidance of rigidity in the soft curving of her fingers. This combination of gesture with a natural performance style can be likened to Lund's understanding of the Scandinavian style, an influence that would be likely given Baring's time spent working in Europe and working opposite Henning. Barring's performance can therefore be understood as a reflection of what Alison Hodge describes as cross fertilization The process of practitioners sharing, learning from and influencing each other, 
as well as separating from, adapting and developing certain approaches to performance styles. So concentrating on this idea of cross-fertilization and barring usage of various performance techniques, this next section will explore the vast shifts in style as Barring adapted her particularly gestural silent performance style upon the transition to sound. By analysing Barring's performance in the 1930 sound film Murder, it's possible to examine the shifting Barring's performance style as she moved from her last silent film to the sound film performance she produced the following year. In doing so, it would be possible to unpick the impact of this shift on particular expectations of performing emotion within the context of early British sound. In the film, Barring plays Diana, a young actress wrongly imprisoned following the murder of her theatre troupe co-star. In the climax of the film, one of the jurors, Sir John Menier, played by Herbert Marshall, goes to visit Barring to find out what really happened on the night of the murder. With her hands placed on the table in front, Barring interlocks, rings and picks at her fingers before looking downwards to the floor and saying, it's good of you to come, but I can't help saying, I'm extremely surprised. Neither Barring's expression nor her delivery displays the histrionic representation of surprise as performed in her silent films, denoted by wide eyes, open mouth or frozen movement. Rather, the context of the, the content of the dialogue indicates her surprise, while her voice is calm, speaking slowly with a soft, relaxed expression on her face. Nevertheless, as she speaks, her subtle but constant movement suggests a restrained nervousness. As Marshall tries to discuss the trial, Barring quickly interjects and moves her hands abruptly to her lap, saying, don't, let's talk about it, with the word don't pronounced forcefully. Barring pauses, looks down towards the floor again and inhales deeply. She breathes out, lifts her head and smiles. How's your play going? She asks, changing the subject. As Marsha replies, the camera focuses on Barring, sitting upright with her shoulders down and hands in her lap. When Marshall suggests the option of appealing the jury's decision to convict her, the camera cuts back to Barring, who's dropped her chin down and is leaning forwards, clutching the sides of the table. She rolls her head to the side and upward, lifts her gaze and says, I knew that would happen. In a short excerpt of her performance, Barring has verbally and visually engaged with a complex laying, layering and switching between emotions all without any clearly distinguishable gestural engagement that could be easily compared with her silent performances. Rather than relying on or drawing on extended gesture or movement to display her nervousness, fear and looming threat of being hanged, a scenario, a scenario similar to the nervousness, fear and looming threat of her jilted partner, Barring has presented her emotions primarily through th small movements, juxtaposing speeds and emphasis in vocal interjections. For example, the fidgeting of her fingers combined with the slow moving and tilting of her head suggests an attempt to mask or conceal her fear. Likewise, barring sudden interjection when Marshall discusses the trial, followed by a big intake of breath and a smile, shows her urgency to move on from a distressing topic of conversation. Barring's final position in this example, with her body positioned forwards, dropping her head and slowly but firmly holding onto the table, is representative of the desperate attempt to maintain her composure, signifying an effort in trying to maintain some restraint as the character is no longer able to control her fate. This process of performing smaller, more subtle movements in screen acting to present a sense of restraint, as opposed to a lack of engagement in performance, can be likened to Christine Gledhill's investigation into a distinctly English style of underplaying. In her work, Gledhill references an unnamed critic who once, who once proclaimed that it is such emotion as is not expressed by tears and sobs that brings tears to my eyes and sends cold shivers down my spine. With Gledhill suggesting that the point here is not lack of emotion, but how it's signified. The reference to restraint in relation to sobs and tears in this comment is particularly interesting as when tears are visible in Barring's eyes later in the scene, she is not subject to extreme close-up, nor is her crying framed as a pinnacle of emotive movement, as it would have been during her silent performances. Rather, they're swiftly wiped away with a tissue, and Byron con continues to speak, her voice only slight sounding slightly more strained. The emotion in the scene is driven by Byron's avoidance to appear to give in, 
as Gledhill argues, that restraint provides pleasure only if we see and feel that there is something to restrain. However, while this analysis is concerned with challenging the pejorative notions attributed to women's excessive melodramatic performance, it should be noted that Byron's performance of restrained emotion was still subject to criticism in the contemporaneous popular press. In an article in the Film Weekly, studio correspondent Narina Shute wrote of Byron, because she has only been cast in tragic roles, it has occurred to no one that perhaps she can do something different. She's a victim of her own talent. Indeed, much of the magazine coverage of Barring surrounding her short-lived career emphasised her being unequalled for tragic parts, while also commenting that a bad part or two might kill her, suggesting that having been typecast to a, such a specific role, Barring could struggle to win other parts should audiences grow tired of her tragic roles. In her work, Gledhill addresses this particular debate and the specific gendering of the discourse surrounding British women's screen acting, melodrama and restraint. Gledhill suggests that if the re repression that produces underplaying was much more admired as a source of authority in male actors, the impact of restraint on female acting was far more problematic. Referencing an article by Monty Banks from the Film Weekly, Gledhill writes, associating women with melodrama, Banks notes that Western culture expects from the represented woman emotional sympathy and temperament. However, the British code of reserve is so pronounced in women that it requires much skill to make them unbend, to lose their coldness. What Gledhill's work highlights here is a paradox in British cultural expectations of women's performances of emotion that women cannot win. That is, performances of emotion that were considered natural have been criticised as excessive, but so too have restrained displays of emotion for being unnatural and cold. Nevertheless, in Barring's murder Barring's performance in Murder, there is certainly evidence of a screen acting style that seeks to offer a balance between a release of emotion and restraint as she lays up and shifts between emotional states. The analysis of Barring's silent and sound performances demonstrates an incredibly well harnessed skill in shifting and adapting screen acting styles. Barring silent performances draw strong parallels between various theatrical and European influences and highlight an awareness of the body in creating tension on screen. Barring sound performances showcase an ability to modulate and reduce those moment, uh, movements to create tension through a layering of emotion. The movement of head, face, hands, torso and voice are utilised to offer a complex embodied emotion, providing a glimpse of heightened emotion before employing restraint. Furthermore, through a consideration of emotion restraint, this case study has begun to recognise the immense skill employed by Barring evidencing that while responding to direction, she ultimately has control over the embodied action. Okay, so let's look at Madeleine Carroll. So in 1939, see how I'm doing for time, yeah. So in 1939, Picture Girl Weekly described Madeleine Carroll as one of the most beautiful and talented women on screen today. Carroll's emergence into the film industry in 1928 offered a contrasting representation of womanhood to the girlish, blonde-haired British stars such as Mabel Poulton and Betty Balfour that have come before her. As Gledhill asserts in her consideration of the transatlantic star image, Carol was identified by reviewers as representing an upper-class national femininity, adding that while reviews of Carol's films invariably noted on her charm, restraint and competence, they increasingly complained of a coldness often blamed on colourless parts, offering little opportunity for acting. However, while Carol's on-screen performance style can clearly be seen to embody this much commented upon British reservedness, the focus on a supposed coldness and the star image of the icy blonde inhibits a deeper consideration of this as a deliberate and interesting mode of performance. Moreover, the preoccupation or fetishization of Carol's haughty star image in place of a deeper consideration of performance particularly her silent film, film performances that paved the way for her stardom, means that examples in which Carol offers alternative styles of performance have not been included in her film history narrative. Indeed, while Carol's use of silence and restraint in her performances of emotion demonstrates the skill to build emotional intensity in a sound film, Carol's silent film performances offer a striking example in which she draws on the opposite technique. That is, while Carol's sound films make use of long moments of silence to portray pathos, Carol's silent performance style 
is conversely heavily reliant on the delivery in, of inaudible dialogue in her embodied performances of emotion. In fact, Carol's use of the inaudible voice in her silent film performances, to the extent that observing moments in her silent film performances appear as though she is performing a fully scripted play, highlights a focus on the mouth leading the physical gesture. Examples of Carol's use of an inaudible dialogue can clearly be seen in her silent melodrama, The Firstborn. In the film, Carol plays an upper-class woman, also called Madeline, who is married to a philandering, aspiring politician, Sir Hugo Boycott, played by Miles Manda, who is desperate for an heir. Throughout the film, moments of conversation between Carol and her co-stars are often shown with a focus on Carol's delivery of inaudible dialogue with the occasional intertitle relaying the ends of the sentences. Following the opening montage in which Carol and Amanda are shown to be arguing, Carol peers out of the window to the street below as Miles gets into his motor car. Carol turns to the butler who is about to exit the room, presses her lips together, moving a tissue delicately between her fingers. With her eyebrows raised expectantly, she leads towards him and asks him a question. Carol delivers her inaudible lines swiftly and although difficult to lip read and no intertitles are given, it can be inferred that she is asking after her husband. The camera cuts to the butler and an intertitle relays his response. Sir Hugo wishes me to tell your ladyship that he will be away for some time. Carol closes her eyes, nods slowly, lets out a deep sigh. She lowers her head and continues to play with the tissue now gripped in her hands. She speaks again, Another brief line to which the butler nods and turns, indicating that she has now told him that he may leave. In the short interaction during which Carol and her co-star remain reactively, sorry, relatively static in their conversation, Carol's emotional expression is delivered through an embodied performance that incorporates deliberate visual speech. The scene establishes the fraught relationship between the couple through a succinct conversation between the lady of the house and her staff, which not only conforms to the representation of the British upper-class reservedness, but can be read as establishing the brisk and direct persona for which, barring, uh, sorry, for which Carol later became known. However, after the butler leaves and Carol is alone, she is shown to relinquish that restraint. She brings her hands to her face and throws her head back in anguish. The result of this short sequence is a fully embodied performance that combines and modulates dialogue and silent gesture in a representation of emotion that conforms to British expectations of melodrama, public restraint, and a moment of private passion. Carol's relinquishing of her emotional restraints after the butler leaves also furthers both the gendered and class-based expectations of emotion, determining who can and who can't be privy to these outbursts and not displaying certain emotions in front of servants especially male servants. With the cause of their marital problems being the need for an heir, Carol seizes the opportunity when her manicurist Phoebe, played by Marjorie Roach, reveals her distress at becoming unexpectedly pregnant out of wedlock. Carol invites Roach back to the house to re relay her plan. She will take her baby. Standing against the back of the sofa, her arms raised out to the side, resting on the top of the cushions, Carol is shown to be speaking at Roach, her animated face smiling as her mouth moves. No intertitles are given to indicate exactly what she is saying, but the camera cuts to Roach, who appears apprehensive. Carol moves, moves, crouch, sorry, moves to crouch beside Roach, who is sat on the chair, with her back to the camera slightly angled so that the left side of her jaw is showing. Carol carefully removes Roach's hat and scarf. As she does this, the visible part of Carol's face clearly shows that her mouth is moving as she continues to speak to Roach. Then cuts to a close-up of Carol, face on, and an intertitle to relays part of Carol's inaudible dialogue. Listen, Phoebe, I promise to help you. Now we can help each other. In a stylized sequence that dissolves back and forth between Carol and Roach's faces, Carol stares directly into the camera and delivers another section of inaudible dialogue. Carol speaks at a slow and steady pace, with her mouth making clearly defined movements. Her eyebrows rising and falling, her head tilting and nodding for emphasis. A second intertitle reads, Please say yes, Phoebe, confirming and reinforcing Carol's persuasive speech, uh, relaying this plan to Roach. Unfortunately, it's not possible to access screenplays of Carol's silent films to determine which sections of dialogue are scripted 
or the level of improvisation used. As Ian MacDonald and Jacob Jacob point out in their study into lost early British screenplays, the silent film period to 1930 is particularly affected by this lack of national care, adding the BFI has less than 100 British scripts from this period. Nevertheless, Film Weekly archives provide useful examples of articles attributed to Carol in the 1930s, in which she appears to address her own screen acting processes, including her use of improvisation, and wanting to develop her character beyond what a script or director asks of her. Demonstrating what Gledhill describes as Carol's proto-feminist polemic against cinema's misplaced idealisation and misrepresentation of women, Carol's article, Farewell to Heroines, addresses the desire in a shift in expectations of women and screen in Britain. She writes, I think most of us are glad the day is over when an actress is told, as I was told early in my career, don't bother what, an act, what the character thinks or what she feels, all that matters is what she does. On another occasion, when my part was being described to me, the only directions given to me were that I had to be a nice girl with whom two men were in love. A man I appeared interested to know more about the character, my informant just said, isn't it clear? It's perfectly simple. You've got two men in love with you and you are a nice girl. What more do you want? Through her writing, Carol asserts that she's keen to break out from the straight jacket of wholesome and conventional Miss England roles. Her opinions on the need to for an actresses to be able to demonstrate agency within their profession are underpinned by a disillusionment with the representation of women on screen. In an earlier article, Carol wrote, wrote that she is treading on delicate drowned, but that jazzy flappers were made to be seen and not heard, and that the talky heroine must speak her lines intelligently. Indeed, while writing this within the context of the transition to sound, it's possible to infer the significance that Carol places on the delivery of dialogue and its equal relevance to her silent performances. Therefore, while it's not possible to determine the degree of autonomy of Carol's performances of inaudible dialogue, these analyses highlight the significant role it plays in the development of her screen acting style and the role it had on the continuation of her sound film performances. But that's not to say that her silent performances do not engage with screen acting styles that can be viewed under the umbrella of gestural melodrama. Towards the end of the film, Carol and Amanda engage in a number of physical altercations, with Carol and Amanda throwing objects at each other before Amanda throws Carol onto the bed and almost strangles her to death. At the emotional climax of the film, when Amanda tells Carol that he's leaving her, Carol propels herself across the room and throws herself at his feet. She tells him that she loves him and begs him to stay, crawling on the floor after him. In these sequences of heightened emotion, the close-up of Carol's face as she pleads with Amanda includes more frequent intertitles. This is possibly to ensure the fast-paced action can be followed by the audience while retaining a focus on Carol's inaudible dialogue. Hugo, you can't leave me. Don't you understand? I love you, she cries, shaking her head and wrapping her arms around his waist. Carol's performance of vulnerability and overt gesture in this scene is an element of her performance style that is rarely, if ever, acknowledged. These moments which demonstrate the intense, volatile, violent and physical nature of the character's private relationship stand in stark contrast to the scenes in which they exhibit public composure. However, in terms of understanding these performances in relation to Carol's stardom, it's interesting to consider how this characterization fits in with her perceived star image. Following a fight scene, an intertitle reads, Madeline was a woman prompted to hide her own distress and put up a bold pretense at Hugo's final meeting reinforcing this idea of restrained emotion. As Gledhill writes, in Britain, as natural becomes defined in terms of class infected and demonstrativeness, melodrama increasingly carries a working class or feminized attribution. However, Carol's performances of heightened emotion offer a balance of highly gestural embodied displays with a simultaneous focus maintained on the delivery of inaudible dialogue. As such, this can be read as trying to offer a balance between the supposed bar binaries of melodramatic and upper class representation, with moments of emotion exploding through, no longer able to be contained. The observation that Carol's use of brisk verbal delivery, a style that is framed as being fundamental to her star image later in her career, was being utilised as a performance technique within her silent films as well, opening up a unique perspective through which her stardom and success as a British screen actress might be discussed. It's a way that, it's a way which privileged privileges her individual screen acting style 
clearly developed long before her performance in Hitchcock's The 39 Steps. Having offered a number of exam examples of close analysis, uh, analysis of performance, it's possible to showcase the immense skill and technique employed by actresses, providing insight into the embodied experiences and agency demonstrated by Barring and Carol in terms of their screen performances, centralizing their carefully crafted performances of emotion. I'd like to end by providing some further biographical detail, contextualizing the respective accomplishments towards the end of the 1930s, following the end of their screen in careers, contributing to their overall narratives in terms of a fully encompassing history of women working in the film industry. In a 1932 interview for Film Weekly, Byring discussed in detail that although she loved her job as an actress, she was conflicted by her role as a mother and her desire to stay home. Although she returned to the screen following the birth of her daughter, it was not long before she retired from the industry completely. Indeed, while it's important to recognise magazines' particular framings of motherhood as being bound up with Byring's screen persona, Byring's actions over the course of 10 years following her absence from the screen supports this assertion. And a 1942 local Derby newspaper revealed that the actress had moved from her home in Surrey to the Welsh countryside, where she housed and cared for over 20 evacuee children as part of the war effort. In 1946, Barring wrote an account of her experiences in the war in a novel titled A Friendly Hearth. By the 1960s, Barring had moved back to Surrey and was reported to have opened a curiosity shop in the village of Cobham. When asked if she wishes she could return to performing, she replied, no, this, what I am doing now is marvellously in interesting and I am enjoying it so much. Unlike Barring, Carol was still making films at the time that war broke out in 1939. Yet while her silent performances have begin, been, begin ignored, Madeleine Carroll's humanitarian efforts during the war have been recognised more recently. As such, there's footage produced by British Pathé showing Madeleine Carroll having given over her chateau to house evacuee children also, with her fame at the time seeing her receive a Legion of Honour medal. Carroll eventually retired from film acting in 1949. For a short period in the 1950s, Carroll accepted a role on radio soap opera The Affairs of Dr Gentry, but dedicated much of her time advocating for displaced children following the war. In her hometown of West Bromwich, a monument was revealed in 2012 to honour her work in the film industry, as well as the Red Cross. But of course, it's not just Barring and Carol's fascinating story of skill, power and agency that have been negated within film history. And this is especially true where the, explo where the exploitation of women has also been erased or ignored, um, which is a whole other area of research that I'm also actively involved in. Um, so whether that is sort of actress, director, producer relationships, um, examples such as Lillian Gish and D.W. Griffith, uh, Clara Bow and B.P. Schulberg, Louise Brooks and G.W. Pabst are just a few examples for whom film industry has cherry picked the brilliance and supposed creative genius of the male director producer, which is then sort of taught over and over sort of within film history courses, ignoring or skimming over or in sometimes justifying their abusive behavior and treatment of women. It's therefore my intention to bring to the foreground the creative efforts and embodied experience of women who are pushed aside within these discourses to showcase the fascinating insights they offer in terms of alternative perspectives of film history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for that uh, fantastic paper. Um, we will be taking questions in chat or anybody wants to put their hand up um, for the next little while. I know that I have a few things um, that I'd like to use as, as, as small provocations, Jennifer. Um, one is a, a, a recurring theme here was the transition uh, in the era uh, from silence to to sound. Just really interested about the extent to which that was perceived as an opportunity for progression and how many movements or were there many movements or individuals who tried to coalesce around that moment um, to, to, to aim for a significant shift in how film manifested. So in terms of my research into the transition, a, what, a lot of what I've um, 
found as well in, in terms of the treatment of women was that the studios were really panicking and they were sort of the treatment of women was horrendous at the time with them not wanting to they sort of like with pay freezes and not wanting to sort of renew certain actresses contracts in case they didn't um perform well there was sort of a big trend in they sort of deciding what was going to be sort of the new style of sort of star image they wanted and training certain actresses um and ignoring others trying to sort of really squeeze certain performances so Clara Bow for example is somebody who her sort of flapper image was beginning to wane it was becoming less popular um but she was such a huge sort of money maker for Paramount and so they were just churning, churning, churning stuff out and sort of really overworking her. So her history of sort of mental health at the time of the transition um, is quite interesting how she ended up in a sanatorium after sort of BP Schulberg refused to let her have a break. Whereas people like Greta Garbo, who's somebody who they maybe thought was a bit more um, sophisticated, they gave her lots of sort of speech training to help her across the transition. Um, and then with someone like Madeleine Carroll, who was very much embodied um, that sort of upper class, more sophisticated presentation of women. She had the stage experience. Um, so when it sort of came to the transition to sound, a lot of sort of money was put sort of behind her to really get her star image out there. So in terms of how studios reacted sort of with the transition and how it affected women was that there was a lot of criticism for those who had were really established as silent stars um, while the studios tried to find who they were gonna choose to sort of promote um, and give extra training and sort of special, special treatment to. That's great. Um, just want to spend a moment on, on Madeline Carroll and this, uh, the charter that she wrote, the, the, the article. Um, to your perspective, who was that, what was the target of that article? Was it a plea to, a, did you see that as a plea to a general public or to directly to writers and or directors? So I'd say, so in my PhD would talk about uh, whether or not it was even Carol that wrote them, but it was definitely sort of framed as being written by her. Um, and part of what the studios were trying to do with her sort of star image was position her as sort of an intellectual. So whether it was actually sort of a call um, for change that was, I think it's hard to know whether it was part of publicity or if it was, if it was her giving her opinion to the studios or to the public, but she wrote so frequently about it and sort of in interviews sort of following that, that it does seem like it, yeah, probably aimed at the studios, but I think, with fan magazines sort of publications, it's impossible to sort of know if it, what, how much of it is sort of is, is publicity. But I think in terms of how it shapes how she's presented, it presents her as this sort of proto-feminist type in sort of intelligent character that's sort of advocating for change. And she was, as she sort of demonstrated later on in her life, she was an advocate for change. It's sort of often sort of focused on the treatment of children, um, but she was, somebody who advocated and sort of shared her thoughts and opinions to large sort of official organizations and bodies. Thank you. Um, I was really, as, as somebody who's, who's done the whole drama school journey myself and what is and isn't focused on, um, the idea of different cultural backgrounds and whether it's to do with class or whether it's to do with nationality, informing a character's demeanor as you were talking about with with carol's performance techniques and styles do you feel that that was in some way swept away by a tidal wave of naturalism or in, in, in a psychological realism that came in or that perhaps there was a sense of losing a lot of the innovation that was being brought in by these techniques yeah, so part of what, so my PhD focuses on 1926 to 1934, and it looks at, um, yeah, the shift between sort of histrionic and very similar, so moves towards sort of psychological realism, but also looks at how, because sort of Stanislavski techniques, for example, although weren't sort of published and sort of in circulation until like the 1930s, 
the work of the sort of Moscow Art Theatre was being used by silent film performers from sort of the early 20s. So there is definitely sort of a crossover that happens sort of all throughout. There's definitely sort of elements of psychological rhythm trying to sort of come through in silent performances, just as there are examples of like really highly gestural performance in sound films. But then that that does sort of tend to dwindle sort of maybe 34 onwards, but there is still sort of a huge area, the sort of the start of the sound period up until sort of 1934, where there's like that really blended performance style where again sort of people like Mary Pickford who I guess were were there at the very beginning of sort of Griffiths trying to sort of create a certain style of like melodramatic performance in sort of the early sort of 19 teens and then still performing in the 1930s there's still a lot of that gestural melodrama happening whilst trying to also incorporate um sort of more sort of naturalist and, and realism so there's a huge yeah, I definitely wouldn't say that there's like a linear trajectory. There's lots of crossover and sort of going um, backwards and forwards as people try and sort of navigate what was, how it was going to work, what people wanted to see. No, that's great. Um, really interesting. Uh, if if there's nothing else at the moment, I'll because I, I, I'd really like to come back to bearing for a moment then and, and talk about regional theatre, because I think my, certainly my picture of regional theatre and what I would associate with the techniques of British regional theatre would probably come from the 60s and 70s and it'd be some kind of bodging it together and mucking in kind of collection of techniques. What what was the experiences from regional theatre that you see in Baring's performances in the 20s and 30s? Because I, I don't know what regional theatre looked like in 10s and 20s. Yeah, so a lot of it is sort of my research into that is informed by the trends in the 1920s of people teaching themselves to act through sort of amateur dramatic um, actor training manuals and still using this idea sort of Del Sartian techniques, poses, um, and thinking about sort of received emotions and learning sort of set things of sort of facial expressions. <laughs> so a lot of actor training, I guess for sort of amateur dramatic and like smaller sort of regional theatres, a lot of it is, again, informal modes of actor training so whether that's people hearing about sort of the Moscow Art Theatre and learning about Stanley Vlasky techniques and then reading um, sort of actor training manuals where people try to sort of theorize it themselves and give examples of how you can do it yourself so a lot of it was sort of how to do it yourself using a lot of sort of a blended blended techniques from all different sort of uh, developing practitioners that were going on at the time so yeah a lot of cross fertilization a lot of informal training practices going on. Bringing it together, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, let's see, if I, have I got anything else? I, yeah, I just, I'd not thought about the extent of transitions to sound and that kind of era. I know obviously the Sunset Boulevard is a very prominent film that, that deals with that, but the sort of the effects that that must have had on the, the industry, I think really interesting to hear about. Um, are there any focused um, lessons that you feel moving forward? Is that in terms of the the stories of these of these two performers that are most relevant for our contemporary moment? What what do you take away from this in terms of the now? I think. I think maybe some people are maybe in sort of contemporary society maybe recognising more that film is inherently sort of collaborative and people are sort of moving away maybe from the idea of sort of the auteur um, and people recognising, yeah, the skill of certain screen actors. But I still think in terms of, um, I guess, stories where directors are using questionable or sort of outrightly sort of problematic um, techniques that these are sort of challenged. I think there is still an issue where certain people are still keen to sort of frame the idea of sort of the director's genius um, and do so just takes away from the skill and sort of labour of screen acting as a as a professional, as a skill, as a labour, um, and the actors don't just sort of appear on screen and are fantastically sort of made performances aren't just created by the directors, the editor, uh, sort of the editors. And that also that performances aren't just sort of natural. So you'll still get a lot of people, a lot of dis sort of discussions 
about screen stars and just being like, oh, they don't even need to act. They just they're just themselves on screen, and that in itself just like takes away the amount of skill and training that goes in to being a professional a professional performer. So I think changing discourses on the language that's used to describe film acting um, is really important. I, I think the evaluation of film acting is a really relevant topic you know that the extent of directors being credited with actors work and indeed in many cases looking at things like the um what tends to win a lot of awards the extent to which wardrobe and costume and makeup uh tends to be missed out with regards to uh, used as the critiques of actors work Mm. Um, you know, and people uh, not to cast aspersions on Lily James, for instance, but but showing pictures of Lily James as Pamela Anderson, what an incredible transformation! Is yeah. uh, what a, what an extraordinary acting performance that these hair and makeup and costume people have primarily been the facilitators of. That there is this hidden chain um, throughout film. Yeah, you could probably do a whole other paper, sort of against what I've just said, with people sort of people how sort of makeup artists and costumers don't get the credit for when they, like when actors are taking credit, the costume departments. Cause that was, again, another thing that comes up in the sort of 1920s actor training manuals and this idea of informal training, that chapters on acting are sort of are normally just as big as the chapters on makeup and costume. Like they're just, they're considered just as significant um, to it. Yeah, so it was definitely, yeah. It's sort of hidden labor going on there. Within film and the collaboration, that's a fantastic fantastic point and probably something to finish on it is five two so thank you once again so much uh, jennifer for your for your contributions today and this and this fantastic paper um we have uh, in five minutes i think we have yeah because of three uh, our industry roundtable begins so i think it's probably appropriate that we just have five minutes in between for people who've been with us the whole time so that anybody who wants to up to the facilities or or get a drink uh, has time to do so um, and I will probably wrap things up here and uh, when our, our chair comes in for three. So thank you very much once again, Jennifer, and uh, I'll pass on now.